topic is reinforcement learning and uh, yeah let's grab our attention by this little mover here now we removed these little legs completely but it should work too yeah We can, for example, invert the feedback Oh, look at this And it really depends on the on the underground. And that's a different policy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so maybe maybe this policy is optimal. Maybe not. Maybe this other policy which was like that um is optimal. And so if the policy we had right at the end was not optimal, then maybe the reason was kind of a local minimum problem. Now we found a policy which is good, but maybe there is a different policy which is better, but the robot does not find this different policy. And this depends on what we call exploration. So uh, that's why maybe you have seen it, even when the robot has found a good policy, from time to time it makes some random actions in order to explore uh, whether there may be a different policy which is even better. Okay, but we will talk about this exploration uh, thing later. Okay, now let's go into the, the formal um, terms we need for, uh, to, uh, in order to talk about uh, reinforcement learning. Um, first of all, our agent now is an autonomous agent that only interacts with the environment. Uh, so the agent decides to take some action and then the action is performed and the action of course has some influence on the robot and the environment. So the world may change due to the action the robot performs. And now um, the agent has to observe the environment. The agent has to observe the state of the world. Um, you may imagine robots where this is not necessary. For example, this guy. In the ideal case, when everything works very well, this little robot um, does not need to watch the environment. Why? Suppose a robot is in this state and this joint here takes the action go to, so from your perspective it would be left. Move left one step then it would do that. And now if, I mean if I tell my body move this arm by 10 degrees in this direction then the arm will move. So I do not have to watch, even if I'm blind when I do this, I know my arm now moved. Yeah? Um, but this, is, this assumption only holds for extremely simple systems. 
first for extremely simple systems and second no det uh, a fully deterministic world. Suppose the robot sends the command move in this direction but suppose I would block it with more power than the robot has then uh, the result of this action is different. So it's a good idea to observe the environment in order to see what happens. So and this is the, the typical uh, perception action cycle that runs infinitely in all autonomous agents or robots. Okay, I mean this is nothing new. Uh, this is well known in control theory. Everybody who controls an autonomous system works with this cycle. Uh, um, but now once our agent is um, or should be able to learn, this is not enough. Um, because the agent has to optimize his behavior. And so in order to optimize a function, we need an objective function. And an objective function tells the agent whether an agent, uh, an, an, sorry, an action was good or not. Or maybe you even get a feedback that tells you on the long run uh, what your performance was. Yeah? And um, yeah, that's why uh, we need also such a reward feedback from our environment. And uh, I mean, in our robot, this reward comes from this encoder here. The encoder tells the robot whether it moves forward or backward, and it also gives the speed. And uh, so the higher the speed is, the higher is the reward. And for negative speed, we get a negative reward. Okay. Now the learning task, um, yeah, the task for the robot is given uh, some state S at time T to perform such an action AT, which then um, moves the world into the successor state, ST plus one. Uh, um, so, yeah. And I mean, this transition from the old state to the new state, we call uh, this the transition function delta. Uh, given the current state and an action, delta um, does the transition to the next state. Okay, and then we have this reward. The reward uh, depends on state and action, of course. Yeah? Um, so the same action in a different state may give a different reward. Yeah? And we have positive reward, no reward, and negative reward. Okay, yeah. And uh, so now uh, a policy, a policy typically called pi, is a mapping from the set of states onto the set of actions. So that's actually what the robot has to learn. It has to find such a mapping uh, that maps an arbitrary state onto uh, uh, yeah, uh, onto an uh, ideally optimal action. So for any state, the robot must know what is my action for this state. That's what we call a policy. Yeah? And a policy is optimal, and that's important now, if it maximizes the long-term reward. That's important. Yeah. Um, why, why is the long-term reward so important? Um, yeah. Look, if we take this robot, um, it may take this action and then this. And this would maximize the reward. If I am here, um, the, the short-term reward, so the short-term reward is maximal if I do it like this and that. Yeah? Um, 
but maybe the long-term reward when I'm in this, in this state, the long-term reward is even better if I first move up here, then move down here. That would take me some time, but then I can do this really long move that on the long run brings me much further forward than just doing such a, a little action and then back up again. Yeah? Uh, and that's why the long-term reward is important. Or let's uh, talk about chess playing. Um, and suppose we have a chess playing agent that learns playing chess by reinforcement learning. Then um, a policy with high short-term reward is um, to to hit as many of the op opponent's um, figures as possible, yeah? and and then on the on the uh, on the short term, you would be quite successful, but maybe at the end you would uh, lose anyway because your opponent would uh, immediately after that hit your own uh, objects. Yeah? Okay, now how can we model this long-term reward mathematically? Um, I mean, if long-term means time towards infinity. Uh, so if this agent would run infinitely long, then what would be a policy that gives us an optimal behavior for infinitely long time? Yeah, then, um, yeah, what, I mean, the, the the easiest approach would be um, to use, I mean, if we are now at uh, time t, then we take the immediate reward at this time. Yeah? Um, so which in case of our uh, crawling robot would be the speed that we have now plus the reward at the next time step, plus at t plus 2, plus and so on, until infinity. And we have to maximize this sum. But now there is a problem. What is the problem with maximizing this infinite sum? The problem is with all infinite sums, whenever you have an infinite sum, you immediately have to ask whether this converges. Huh? Or in other words, whether this sum is a finite value. Huh? If all these rewards are, let's say, one, then it's infinite. How can you maximize an infinite function? I can't do that. Huh? That's not possible. So we need, in order to apply mathematics, we need um, series sums that converge. Otherwise, we have a problem. Okay. Now, how can we solve this problem? The first approach, and that's the most commonly used approach, is we take the immediate reward plus gamma times RT plus 1. You see, we introduce a discount factor here at this point. So we make this value smaller by a constant factor of gamma. And this gamma here is um, a number which is smaller than 1. So this value is being discounted. And then here we take uh, gamma squared, so another factor gamma, and then gamma cubed, and so on. And this is our, now our infinite sum. And this sum converges under some assumption. Now look at this sum. Why does this sum converge?
let's make a, a, a very simple assumption. Let's assume the reward from the environment is constant and it is equal to 1. Then this sum i equals 0 to infinity uh, gamma to the power i times times 1. So now what is this? Why, why does this uh, uh, sum converge? Yes, you're right. I mean, gamma power i um, goes to zero. But this is, this is necessary but not sufficient for convergence of the series. It's necessary, of course. I mean, if, if the terms in, inside the sum uh, do not go to zero, then there is no chance. But it's not sufficient. But why does this, this, this sum converge? I mean, this is a well-known, this is the geometric series. Huh? This is the geometric series. And we even have a simple formula for the limit of this geometric series. What is, what is the formula? It's 1 over 1 minus gamma. But of course, this only holds for gamma smaller than 1. OK. So now, here you see everything is fine, perfect. But what about here? We have this factor RT plus I, the reward. So this. Uh, in each term you have the, the reward. Can, the, can this um, disturb our convergence or even kill convergence? Now try to you try to be the adversary. What can you do to this sum to, to make it not converge? In order to converge for such a sum, the terms have to go to zero fast enough. So what could you do with the R's? You let them go to infinity. If the R's go to infinity and you multiply it with the gammas, then of course it's the question uh, if, if the R's, yeah, then you have a problem. Huh? Okay, but the other way around. What is our necessary condition on the R's such that the whole um, uh, sum converges and the condition is the R's have to be bounded. R's have to be bounded. So if all the RT's, the absolute values of our rewards are smaller than some number, some bound B, then everything is okay. Is this clear to you? Or should I prove it? Could you do the proof? <laughs> okay. Now let's... Uh, our, um, uh, let's write it like that. T equals zero to infinity RT. Now... Um, Then this is 
Ähm ja. Let's look at the absolute value of the whole sum. Ja? This is equal to, I mean, gamma is a positive number. Everything is positive, so we can, we can take this absolute value in here. t equals 0 to infinity, gamma power i times rt, absolute value. Okay, and now you see, this is our assumption. rt is smaller than uh, some constant. Times a constant b. And now since this is a constant, I can move it in front of the sum and then we get b times the sum gamma power i. Okay. But for this sum, we have already the formula, so it is equal to b times 1 over 1 minus gamma. Okay, and you see, here we use the assumption that our immediate rewards are bounded, and then uh, everything is good. And this assumption is, it is realistic. Can you imagine a world where any agent may get infinite reward from the environment? Not on this world, that's what I would assume. Um, okay, yeah. So this is interesting if we really consider an infinite sum. Um, but there is an alternative. Sometimes we are not really interested in agents that for an infinite time scale are optimal. And this is, I mean, for this agent you may uh, really use this. But suppose you have an agent there that has to solve and so-called episodic task, which is a task um, for example chess playing. Every chess game is finite. There is an upper bound of, on the number of moves that uh, typically is in a chess game, so maybe 100 moves. And then what we can, could do is we could just look at a finite sum, 100 steps, and that's it. Huh? Or an agent that has to bring, a robot that has to bring some object from here to somewhere else, and we have a maximum time, and we, then we could limit the number of steps. And we would just have to look at a finite sum. And now, since we have a finite sum, we don't need the discount factor anymore, because in finite sums, we never have any convergence problems. F uh, all finite sums uh, do have a finite value, so we can just use the sum of all the rewards, and then maybe we can divide the whole thing by, uh, by the number of the terms in the sum, so uh, then we have the average reward. We just have the average reward over the whole episode, um, and then after that, we might even take the limit for h towards infinity. But in, in, in many applications, um, maybe even the number of steps is fixed, then we don't have to look at the limit. But taking the limit would be an alternative to this one. But it turns out that almost all algorithms use this re uh, value or reward function, uh, mostly because it's mathematically easier to handle. Okay, yeah. 
a policy is optimal um, if for all states S, that's important, for all states S, um, the cumulative reward for this policy is greater than or equal to the cumulative reward of some other policy. Okay. Yeah, okay. And then um, when you read uh, literature about reinforcement learning, most of the time the first assumption is that we talk about a Markov decision process. Yeah? And we do have Markov processes where the reward for the cur current action only depends on the current state and action. And it does not depend on the past. Um, yes. So, for example, a Markov uh, uh, chess playing is, of course, a Markov decision process. I mean, we just have to look at the state of the chessboard, and it does not matter at all how we came to this state. It just depends on this state. But there are, there are uh, processes where the current decision depends on the past. For example, uh, language, speaking. If your robot has to, wants, for example, learn, learn to speak, then um, how to pronounce the current character, we have seen it in the uh, Net Talk example, depends on what there was before. Maybe it's only um, a past or a time of three characters, but sometimes maybe it depends on 10 or 20 characters, maybe even two sentences, depending whether it was a question sentence or not a question sentence, whatever. Um, so then the current decision depends on a number of states in the past and then we no longer have a Markov decision process and the whole theory is getting more difficult. And most of the following uh, is good for Markov decision processes. Um, okay, and uh, a more general class is the so-called POMDP, Partially Observable Markov Decision Process. And that's when, when our agent has only partial knowledge about the state of the world. Again, chess playing is of course not partially observable because we assume that I know everything about the chessboard. But the real world, of course, is partially observable. I don't know, for example, for this room, uh, the state. Because, for example, I can't see what's behind uh, this table uh, there. Yeah? So I only have partial information. Okay, yeah. Now let's, uh, we move towards algorithms for reinforcement learning. How can this be done? And before we look into the algorithms, I want to show this slide again. We looked at it last time. Um, this slide gives us the number of different policies um, for such a, such a two-dimensional grid. Uh, for example, uh, on our crawling robot, we have such a grid. Um, So the number of states increases quadratically with the size of the grid. The number of policies increases much worse. What is the number of policies? It is the number of um, the number of ways how we can draw to each um, node one arrow in one direction. Oh, let me try, maybe, maybe now the pen works again.
No, sorry. Yeah. So the number of ways how I can draw one unique arrow going out from each of the nodes. Why? Because how is a policy defined? A policy defi is defined as a mapping from the set of states to actions. So for each state, for this state, there must be one outgoing arrow. For this state, there must be one outgoing arrow, and so on. Yeah? And I mean, here I have three possibilities, here three, and so on. So we get three power eight times two power four times four power four, which is this result. And here we get this. Yeah? Even for this extremely simple state space, we get uh, 10 power 12 policies for 5 times 5 states. So it's impossible to... None. Here it might be possible with uh, some effort to find one of these 10 power 12 policies. Oh, but actually... Um, for each one of the policies, we have to test them. We have to test each of the policies. If we would do this on the real robot, that would take us, I mean, uh, one test of one policy takes us, I would say, 10 seconds. And then, just to test the policies, nothing else, just to test 10 power 12 policies, would take 10 power 13 seconds. One year is 10 power 7 seconds. So that's a million years. Just to test all these policies. So it's, yeah, we might say this is impossible. Maybe there is somebody who is so patient to wait for a million years. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there is a general formula. I don't look into this. Uh, um, yes, now let's look at, in this example, at two different policies. We look at this policy. You see we do have a cycle in here. And here is a different policy with a smaller cycle. Um, and now, suppose we, are, we, <laughs> we have this crawling robot. And then intuitively we would say this is the better policy um, under the assumption that these moves here is, it's when the leg is on the floor, this brings the robot forward. Then it goes up and goes uh, back again, then down again, and then it moves the robot forward. And, uh, and now let's compute the discounted reward. Um, and we want to know the cumulative reward for this state for this state as a starting state. So we start in this state and then we follow the policy. What happens? We will move here and then along here and infinitely long we will stay in this cycle here. Now if for this policy we start in this state, we go down here and then move around here all the time. Um, and uh, what, what would happen? Um, we would, sorry, the reward here would be zero huh? because there is no forward move. It would be zero here too, zero, 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 and here I would, uh, I would get a reward of one, one, one. And now we have to count the number of steps. One, two, three, four, five, six. Huh? Um, in step number one, we have a factor of one. In step number two, we have the gamma. So in step number six, we have 
a 1 times gamma to the power 5 plus 1 times gamma power 6 plus 1 times gamma power 7 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 0 0 plus gamma time uh, 1 times gamma power what was that 6 plus 8 is gamma power 14 so you see the terms they are getting smaller and smaller and maybe after two cycles uh, they are so close to zero that uh, they don't worry anymore. Huh? Um, and here in this tabular you see what we get. I mean you, you, can, you, you can compute it by yourself. If we take a gamma of 0.9 then our policy pi 1 starting here gives us a cumulative reward of 2.81. With the same starting state and policy pi 2, this one, we get 2.66. So you see, pi 1 is better. Yeah. Um, but yes, of course, uh, okay. We can um, We can also see that this policy is better by computing the average speed. On average, in, with this policy, so one full cycle is eight actions. Out of these eight actions, three of them, which are these three, they bring the robot forward and all the others, they, they, uh, they do not lead to any moves. So three out of eight actions um, give us a reward of one. Huh? Um, so the average reward per action is 0.375. Um, whereas here, two out of six actions give a reward of one, so the average reward is 0.33. Yeah, and that's why this policy is better than this one. Okay, now we want to look at a first algorithm. Um, we call this algorithm value iteration because it's based on this so-called value function. I mean, this is nothing new. It is our uh, infinite sum with the dis of all the discounted immediate rewards. And yeah, the idea behind this algorithm uh, goes back to Richard Bellman, which was in 1957. That's quite a long time ago. Um, Bellman was a person, a mathematician, who worked on mathematics for control theory. Um, yeah. And he made this assumption, that uh, the assumption that independently from the starting state ST, um, yeah, actually that should be a zero. Oh no, we start at, stay at uh, time t. Independently from the current state st and our current action at, all decisions of possible successor states must be optimal. That's an assumption. Uh, I mean, we are talking about the current action. I am here now in state t at time t and I want to optimize my next action. Uh, and in order to optimize the next action, I have to take some assumption about the future. Yeah? I could assume, one assumption might be, I just do this one action and then I stop. This would lead to a different behavior. Yeah? This would lead to a different behavior. Because I don't uh, worry about the future. For example, um, this one action may lead me into a state which is dangerous and the second action 
would uh, destroy uh, the robot. Uh? I would never do this first action if I would do more than one action. So, um, and the reasonable assumption is I assume that all future actions are optimal. And this assumption will be necessary for the derivation of the formula that we do now. Okay. Now, um, let's look at our cumulative value function, at this value function. Yeah? Um, we are looking for an optimal policy. What is an optimal policy? An optimal policy is one that maximizes this infinite reward. Okay, now let's maximize the infinite reward. This is our f value function and it starts with r of st, comma, at, which is this first reward, plus gamma times the next reward and so on. And I mean here I explicitly wrote the action at because we now maximize, now we, we are searching the maximum over all actions, over the first action, the second action, the third action, and so on. And here you see how uh, the, the Bellman assumption is being applied. We do not only maximize over the first action, but also over all the actions. Okay, uh, I mean, we could stop here. We could stop here, but then if we would stop here, this would mean we would have to evaluate all possible policies. And that would take us too much time. Okay, so, yeah, let's continue. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah, now, um, now we assume that we have a Markov decision process. And this means this first reward only depends on the current state and the current action and nothing else. Um, and if this is the case, then here for this term uh, we only have to maximize over this action and the maximum over all the other actions can be, it can be separated out. Huh? So now we have the maximum over this current action. So we have to find this action AT such that this reward is maximal. That's all. Huh? That's kind of a modularization of the problem. Plus gamma times, and this is the same we had before, but starting one time step later at t plus one. And now we are already finished because compare this here, this maximum with that. It's exactly the same, but it starts here. Yeah? And we have the whole thing divided by one factor gamma, okay? Um, but this, this factor gamma that's missing, that's what we have here. So now this, this maximum here is the maximum over our value function V star of ST plus 1. That's it. Look, V star of ST is this. Now replace T by T plus 1. Replace all T's here by T plus 1. What you get is this. And therefore we can replace this term by V star of T, S T plus 1. Okay, what, what have we learned now? Look, now we have an, we have actually a fixed point equation. 
v star of st is the maximum over at r of st comma at plus gamma times v star of st plus one so if we consider this right hand side as a function of v star of st plus one of this value function then this whole thing is a fixed point equation here that's what we have I mean here I, I removed the, the index t because it's not really necessary if we remove the t here then we can get the st plus one uh, in writing uh, delta of s and a delta is the transition function and the transition function produces the next state st plus one yes so this is now a new function uh, no an, um, this is a a recursive equation for our value function for our optimal value function so once our agent has found its optimal policy then if we apply this right hand side this maximum over this uh, term to the optimal value function there will be no change it reproduces the value function okay I mean we have just uh, that's nice we have just had in mathematics fixed point uh, uh, equations I mean we were talking about equations like um, s is equal to f of s for a fixed point how can we find such a fixed point we start with some value x0 and then we say xn plus 1 is equal to f of xn so we start with some arbitrary initial value apply our um, function and hope that the whole thing converges Um, yeah. So that's how we can find such an optimal value function. Look, that's what we are doing. So we take some, we take a value function which is not optimal. For example, in the beginning we could use zero for all the values uh, I mean how would that look like in a practical example let's look at such a grid world with a 3 by 3 grid our, it may be our walking robot with 9 states and at the beginning we initialize all the values for each state we have such a value of 0 and then we um, and then we apply the iteration you will see it in, in a few minutes in some examples yeah, so this, uh, this v hat here, this is uh, some initial value function, which may be all zeros. Okay, yeah. But then finally, when we have found such a value function, the question is, we don't, uh, I mean, our robot does not want a value function, our robot wants to have a policy and the policy is a mapping from state onto actions so the robot wants to know what action to perform in some state 
Uh, the robot doesn't want to know the value function, but look here, what we do is we maximize over all the actions. So during this process we will find the correct action. So the only thing we have to do is we have to kind of store the correct action and that's why we have to use the argmax function. You know the argmax, what's the difference between the maximum and the argmax function? I guess we had it already before. Let me repeat it. If we have some function f of x, then this is the maximum of the function. Now if this value is 2.5, then the maximum of this function is 2.5. And if I ask where is the maximum? Then I would like to know which is our x here. And if this is 0.73, then this is the point where we find the maximum. And this is, so here it would be 0.73 is equal to arg max f of x for x in the real numbers. And the maximum of f would be 2.5. So the argument, the argument, that's the, that's the, uh, the variable that we, we, uh, that varies. This x, we are looking for an x that maximizes our function. And here we are looking for an action that maximizes the value function. And that's why argmax is the action that maximizes this term. Or, yeah. Okay, and here we have the value iteration algorithm. For all states, we initialize the value function as zero at the beginning, and then we go into this loop, and in, in each iteration, for all states, we apply our recursion formula, our fixed point iteration, one step, and iterate our, over our value function, and we do this, of course, until the value function converges. Yeah? Okay, yeah. And um, I mean there is this simple theorem. I, I omitted here the assumptions. We will have a more detailed theorem including a proof when we talk about um, uh, Q-learning. Um, so under some not too hard reasonable assumptions, the most important assumption of course is that it's a Markov decision process. Uh, yeah, a deterministic Markov decision process. Okay, now let's look at an example. So we have this uh, three by three grid of our walking robot and we initialize all the values as zeros. Um, and look, here we have these little arrows. All these little arrows, they give the possible actions and uh, beneath each of the arrows there is a number. Minus one here, plus one here, zero, zero, zeros. Um, and these are the immediate rewards that our robot gets. So you still can assume this is our uh, crawling robot. And the crawling robot now is like if, so if this joint here is all the way down, then the robot moves. As soon as it goes up one step, 
there is no more move because then the tip is in the air. So this is the only uh, set of states where the tip is on the ground. And when the tip is on the ground, this movement brings me forward and this movement brings me backward. So for this movement I get a plus one, plus one, minus one, minus one and for all other actions I get zero immediate reward. Okay, so that's about our the, a model of our world. And now we apply or we start with reinforcement learning. Maybe we should write the formula on the blackboard. That's what we have to do in each step. And let's start with, oh, it's really unfortunate that this pen does not work. Let me try it. Gromit. Sorry. Um, let's start updating this value here. The new value is we have to look at the reward. Now let's look at this action. We have two possible actions, this one and this one. For this action we get an immediate reward of minus one. Okay, so we here we have minus 1 plus gamma, okay, and we assume here gamma equal 0.9. So we get a minus 1 plus 0.9 times the value of the successor state, which is plus 0. So we get a minus 1. We remember this minus 1 here, um, and now we try the second action, this one. Here we get an immediate reward of 0 plus 0.9 times 0, so altogether it is 0. And now we take the maximum among these two values, among minus 1 from here and 0 from here. And the maximum is 0. So the new value here is 0. That's what we get here. Now we go into this state. And we get a minus 1 plus 0.9 times 0, which is minus 1. That's what we remember. Now here we have 0 plus 0 is 0. And here we have 1 plus 0.9 times 0 is 1. Now the maximum from among 1, 0 and minus 1 is 1. And that's why we get a new value of 1 here. Now let's go, uh, we have the 1 here now, but still the 0 here. Now let's look here. We get an immediate reward of 1 plus 0.9 times this value, which is 0.9. Plus 1 is 1 1.9. That's what we get here because from here we get 0 plus 0.9 times the old value 0. Yeah. Okay, and now we can continue in this row. Okay, so we, we, we do have, we have updated, here we have a 1, here we have a 1.9 and all the rest is zeros. So we can continue and then we would get this row and then we would get that row and that was after one iteration. 
And now we continue. We do a second iteration. Um, yes, so here we get no changes. Is that true? Yes, because of the minus 1 here, we get minus 1 plus 0.9 is minus 1.9 and here we have a 0, so the 0 remains. Uh, um, and again here, yeah, let's, let's maybe um, look at this value. Yeah, here we get from this value times 0.9, which is 0.81 plus the zero. We get the 0.81. Okay, and the whole thing con uh, continues and you will finally see that the values converge to this uh, matrix. Yes, um, and I mean now we have a matrix full of values but what we need is a policy. Now let's make a policy out of this. And the policy is, is not the maximum operation. We don't get it from the maximum operation. We get it from the argmax operation. Here. That's what we have to do now. So we take the result and now we do the argmax of the reward plus gamma times the successor state. Okay, so let's continue here. Minus 1 plus 0.9 times this. So this is about 3. Minus 1 is 2. So we remember here we get um, a value of 2. And now up here we get 0 plus 0.9 times this which is um, 2.7. So here we have 2.7 and here we have 2. That means the better action is this one. Now let's go here. Um, we get um, a 1 plus 0.9 times this, which is around 2.3. 1 plus 2.3 is, remember, so for this one we get about 3.3. For this action, we get um, a minus 1 plus 4 um, plus about 3.6, which is about 2.6. 2.6. And for this action up here, we get 0 plus around 2.9, which is 2.9. And now we take the maximum from these three and you see it's the left action. So this is the action we get here. And you would see that here you would also get the left action and here you would get the down action. Here you would get this one, this one and oh yeah, let's, let's look at the upper row here. This is quite interesting. You, you immediately see that this action and this action would both give you the same value. So you, it, does not, it doesn't matter. You, we can take this action or this action. And also here. Um, and here it would of course be this action. Yeah, you see this value is much bigger than this value. And uh, why does this not matter? I mean, if I start here, it doesn't matter whether I walk like that and come into this cycle or I walk like that and I'm, I mean, it takes me the same number of steps until I'm here where it begins being interesting. 
it is from here it's one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Yeah, I mean that's value iteration. I hope uh, now you understood it and you know how you w could play with such a grid. And if you know this, then you could also implement it. Any questions? To repeat how we get the 1.9 in the grid? 1.9, which one? In the, in the Here. Okay, we take the immediate reward, which is 1 here, plus 0.9 times the value we already have here. But, but why do we take the 1 and not the 0 from the... Um, yes, it's, it's an iterative process. So it matters uh, where we start. Yes, it matters where we start and also the sequence matters. It matters for the individual steps, but it does not matter for the, for the final um, stable state. I mean, this, this grid here would look different if we would have started in this order. Probably, I'm not sure, but it may be different. Oh yes, it would be different. Look, if you start here, everything would remain zero. And this would remain zero too. And here I would have these changes. And that's actually why I started in this order, because then I have more changes in the first iteration. It depends on the order. And therefore, um, I mean, these uh, convergence theorems like that, they only are true if all states in the, in the system are visited infinitely often. Of course, I mean, if you forget one of the states all the time or too often, then this state wouldn't converge. Yeah? So this is only true under the assumption that uh, all states are being visited infinitely often towards convergence. Or, I mean, infinitely often, that doesn't sound good. Maybe we should, uh, we should rather say we need to use a fair selection strategy for the states. And a fair strategy is one that um, after, after some finite time interval, every state has to be, um, to be um, uh, visited once. Yeah? It doesn't matter. I mean, if, if in every 10,000 time steps, we can guarantee that every state is being visited, then we have convergence. Huh? It, of course, it is slower. If I can guarantee that every nine time steps, every state is being watched, it's much faster. Huh? But it, it is not allowed that um, um, one of the states is uh, visited uh, only, um, yeah, never, for example. Of course, that, that, that's not allowed. Or only five times. Um, yeah. So for, for time towards infinity, we have to guarantee that all states are being visited infinitely often. Okay? Um, yeah. Yeah. Look at this uh, statement here. Choosing an action that leads to the state with highest value is wrong. I mean, when we, when we derive the policy from the values, here we have the values. Um, and now look here, 
Um, yes. It is, I mean, taking the, the highest neighbor value leads to the correct actions up here. In all these states, in all these six states, it's correct to move to the neighbor state with the higher value. For example here, I move down here because this value is bigger than this one. But down in this row, um, that's not sufficient because now we would neglect the immediate rewards. No? If I just look at the neighboring value in this state, I would move to the right, but this is not correct. I have to move to the left because the immediate reward, that's very important. So it's not just the, like a greedy jump to the best neighbor state, you have to look at the reward you get, the immediate reward. Okay, yeah. I mean, here we have this computation again. Um, pi star of 2, 3. So I'm in line number 2 and column number 3. Is that correct? No. Sorry, this is column number 2 and line number 3. It's in this state, yes. Um, so I, here I have a plus 1 plus 0.9 times 2.66. That's for the left move. Then for the right move I have the minus 1 plus 0.9 times 4.05. And for the up move we have the 0 plus 0.9 times 3.28. And now we take uh, the maximum out of these values, which are these. And you see, this is the first one. This is for the left move. And therefore, the arc max among these, left, right, up, is left. OK. Ah, yeah, here we have a nice picture of our hardware walking robot. I talked about it last week already. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, this is all about value iteration. But this value iteration algorithm, it's a so-called um, model-based algorithm. Because, um, yeah, let's look here. Because here we need a model of the environment. The robot needs to know a model of the environment. Um, why? When I'm uh, here in the middle at this state and I take the right move here, then I know that I am in this state. And that's important. Our robot has to know this because otherwise the robot couldn't optimize. Look here. This is the right move for this state. And I get, um, oh no, sorry, that's the up move. Here is the right move. I get an immediate reward of minus one from this action. So that's the first uh, thing I have to know. But even more importantly, if I do this action, this, this move right action, I am now in this state. And this knowledge, of course, I mean, it, it, it seems to be trivial. I know when I take this move, then I am one step to the right. But this is only true in a very simple world. Huh? Look, I mean, if I am here and now I do the right move, no, I'm not one step to the right. It depends. It depends on my world. If the world is very simple, 
If the world is so extremely simple that I do have a simple deterministic model of the world, then I can apply value iteration. Otherwise, this is not applicable because I do this move right action, but I don't know in advance which will be the successor state. And if I don't know the, the successor state, then I can't get the value of the successor state and I, can, I cannot apply this algorithm anymore. Yes, but I mean there is an easy solution for this. Um, and this solution, it's the, the usage of the so-called Q function. Before, we had the value function. A value function that gives one value to each of the states. And now, we assign a value to each state action pair, to every state action pair. Um, look, now we are in this state and we, co we may consider taking this action, but we don't know the successor state. The whole thing works if already my action knows Oh, in this state, for that action, you get a reward of uh, 5. And for this action, in this state, you get this reward. Huh? Or, n not reward, you get this value. Huh? Okay, so what we do is, we don't use an, a state value function, but a state action value function. Q of S and A. And now the optimal policy is to maximize the Q values. Instead of the V values, the Q values. Q of S and A. Um, we still work on our discounted cumulative reward function. Um, and then we can now write Q of ST, AT is the maximum over all the actions in our infinite sequence of this function. Huh? So we maximize our, I mean, here, look, our, just we, it's, it is, it is still the same we had before. This right hand side is the same thing as we had before. But what's very important is now we consider our cumulative reward as depending on state and action. So it, the reward now depends on two parameters. Okay, and now we can make the same derivation we did it before. This is again our Q function. Um, okay, I mean we can, look, this is the maximum over all the actions starting from a t plus 1 and so on. We can just take this reward out of the maximum because it does not depend on these variables. And then we have remaining here gamma times the maximum over all these actions of this remainder term. Um, and because this reward, that's because we have a Markov process, this reward does not depend on what's going on in the future, we can take, uh, we can separate out this maximum, maximum over AT plus 1 of this uh, reward plus gamma times the maximum of the rest here. Okay, and now, um, look, this is the Q function for ST and AT. It's the reward plus gamma times maximum of the rest. And what we have here is the reward plus gamma times the maximum of the rest. So, we, so this is nothing but the Q function 
of st plus 1 and at plus 1. And now you see what, what do we have here? We have such a recursive equation again. Yeah. And now um, we want to get rid of the t plus 1. So st plus 1 is delta of st comma at. Um, yes. And this at plus 1, that's the um, the action in the successor state and we will call this a prime and then here we can delete the t because we only have one t left and, we, and a t plus one is a prime so this, that's a simplified notation of the whole thing and uh, yeah and so this is our fixed point equation and again we will solve it iteratively we start with some uh, with some initial q values we will use zeros again as the q values and uh, then we do the q iteration um, yeah let, let's look at this example and then we will finish for today we have now uh, just a 2 by 3 grid again for the walking robot and uh, now, uh, the, the problem now is, I cannot write the immediate rewards into the picture anymore because now our Q values are, uh, you, you see, they will be assigned to these arrows because it's a state action value. In this state, for this action, I have this Q value, okay? So I don't have the space to write the rewards, but the rewards are minus one here, minus one here, plus one here, plus one here, and all the others are zeros. The immediate rewards. And now we do Q learning. And in Q learning, it's now different. Um, in, in value iteration, I can just uh, iterate over any states. In Q learning, I have to define a path where I want to walk in my world. And now I take this path, I move like that, for example, in the first iteration. And during these mo this move down here, um, I will compute the maximum over all the rewards, over this one and this one. This one gives me a minus one. Um, oh no. Why do we get a minus one here? Oh yes, uh, th sorry. We take, what we do in the formula is we take the immediate reward plus the maximum, look, we take the immediate reward plus gamma times the maximum of the Q values of the successor states. Okay, so we take this immediate reward, which is a minus one, plus the maximum of all the rewards from the successor states here. Huh? Uh, from the, sorry, the maximum Q value, and the Q values, they are all zero. So we get a minus one plus zero, which is the minus one. Again here, we get a minus one from, uh, from this immediate reward, plus the maximum of these zeros, which is minus one. And then we, we walk back here, and we will get uh, the plus one from the immediate reward. And now plus the maximum out of the zero, zero, and here we already have the minus one, but a minus one uh, is smaller than zero. So we get plus one, we get a plus one here, and now maybe we do this cycle. We start here, moving around, and we will get these values. And yeah, we will move around on different paths. And finally, under the assumption that uh, with a fair strategy, we will move all state action pairs often enough, uh, the whole thing will converge. And we will then get such a policy. 
So that's Q learning and yeah, we will start at this point next time. We will look at the algorithm and um, also we yeah, will look at a little not too difficult proof that proves uh, convergence of this algorithm. Thank you. Okay, I wish you uh, good vacation. And, yeah.